I want to get to the nub of the matters and I'm afraid I trample through people's sensitivities. You might think that's very rude, but um, my job is to tell people how to get better and then it's up to them how they tackle that. Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah and today I'm talking to Dr. Sarah Myhill, who's a medical doctor and a naturopathic doctor. Now, Dr. Myhill is well known in the medical world and she's much sought after by patients and practitioners because she runs her own practice and hosts trainings and workshops. Dr. Myhill's written over 10 books on subjects ranging from diabetes, healing thyroid, chronic fatigue, dyslexia, infectious diseases and more. She's also spent six months working in the Royal Shrewsbury Hospital with patients with chronic fatigue. So she will be talking about making energy mitochondria, which is vital for life and how this goes wrong and how this is a key factor in chronic fatigue, ME and fibromyalgia. Sarah is also going to talk about her findings over the last 40 years on what makes us sick, carb addiction, which medications are the most harmful, food, structured water and lifestyle changes that we can adopt for optimum health. So I'll hand you over to her now. Welcome to the show, Dr. Myhill. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background? Oh, of course. Um, I'm a conventionally trained um, a medical practitioner. I qualified in 1981. I then worked for 20 years in um, British NHS nat um, National Service as a general practitioner. Um, interested in looking for root causes of disease. And increasingly, I found working within the NHS that I didn't have the clinical freedoms that I needed to be an effective doctor. So in 2000, I left the NHS and I worked as an independent general practitioner and, and have been doing so ever since. So I have 42 years of clinical experience. And um, what drove me to leaving the NHS is with any disease process, I was asking the question, why? Why does this person have arthritis? Why does this person have migraine? Why does this person have blood pressure or whatever? And the problem with conventional modern medicine is the doctors are being educated by big pharma. And big pharma are not interested in patients, they're only interested in profits. And what that means is we have symptom suppressing medication being issued or being prescribed for all these conditions. And the problem with symptom suppression medication, like anti-inflammatories for arthritis, like anti-blood pressure drugs for, for blood pressure, like antidepressants for depression, is that they don't address the underlying causes. They just help the symptoms temporarily. And, you know, we have symptoms for very good reasons. Symptoms tell us there's something going wrong. So what that means is that the underlying pathology, whether it's arterial disease, whether it's poor energy delivery mechanisms, whether it's allergy and inflammation or whatever, go untreated and the underlying pathology accelerates. So what that means is that the more drugs you're prescribed, the faster the underlying pathology will progress and the sicker you will become and the worse is your prognosis. So that's why I started. And of course, you know, when I started in general practice in the 1980s, I didn't have a clue about this because we are not taught this at medical school. But thankfully, I had lovely, willing patients who are happy to be guinea pigs. And I started off doing elimination diets with them. And for many, their migraine disappeared, their headaches disappeared, their irritable bowel syndrome got better, their arthritis improved, and so on. But the patients I was really stuck with were the patients with chronic fatigue, patients, people who knew that they could function better, but simply weren't. And this included top athletes, England cricketers, England footballers, um, all sorts of interesting characters who just knew they weren't um, functioning to their full potential. And this led to an interest in chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. And again, in the 1980s, when I was in general practice, the commonest um, reason for consulting a doctor was the TATT, -T, tired all the time, symptom, clinical picture. Uh, and OK, you might get a blood test. You might just be screened for anemia or obvious underactive thyroid. But there it stopped. And uh, people now no longer go to their doctors with that complaint because they know they have no idea how to treat it. So this became my area of special interest. And when I left um, the NHS in 2000 and started independent practice, this became my subject of, of great interest. And 
The key point to remember about chronic fatigue syndrome and ME is they are not diagnoses. They are clinical pictures. They are a bag of symptoms, but we have to ask the question why. And chronic fatigue syndrome and ME are not the same thing. They are, they are different. Chronic fatigue syndrome is that clinical picture which is characterized by poor energy delivery mechanisms. And we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. ME is the clinical picture where we have chronic fatigue syndrome and inflammation. The body is in an inflamed state. And of course, if it's in an inflamed state, that causes lots of symptoms because inflammation is uh, characterized by pain, well, local inflammation by pain, red heat, swelling, loss of function. And ME is nearly always a painful condition. And that's driven um, often by chronic infection, by allergy and by autoimmunity. And of course, we're now seeing um, epic record numbers of ME because the spike protein from COVID vaccines and from a COVID infection drives inflammation. It's markedly pro-inflammatory. So now we have another condition called long COVID, which is actually part of ME. It's poor energy delivery mechanisms, and inflammation. Just for people listening, what, how does fibromyalgia fit into that? Because that's a related condition and some people have been diagnosed with um, fibromyalgia. So they're really interested in this too. Correct. Again, fibromyalgia is not a diagnosis. It's a clinical picture. And we have to ask the question why. And there are many, there are several possible threats to fibromyalgia. Um, fibromyalgia essentially means pain in the muscles. Now, it can result if you have poor energy delivery mechanisms, because if you're not generating energy efficiently aerobically, that is with with air, with oxygen and with mitochondria working, you we slip into anaerobic metabolism, which is energy generation without oxygen. It's a fermentative process, and the problem with that is that is very inefficient. And if you can't produce energy efficiently, then the body will um, produce lactic acid, which is a, a cheating way of making energy, if you like. And the point about lactic acid is it's painful. And when you get lactic acid building up in your chest, uh, in your heart muscles, you get what's called atypical chest pain. It's actually angina. And when you get lactic acid building up in your muscles, you get muscle pain, um, which we call fibromyalgia. But there are other uh, causes for fibromyalgia. Allergy is a major driver of fibromyalgia. Now, this may be allergy to foods, and the commonest would be um, probably dairy products and grains, gluten grains. But I think a major driver of fibromyalgia is allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut. Now, that's a lot for you to absorb. So let me just break that down into what it means. Now, the human gut is almost unique in the mammal world. Um, because we can cope with so many foods. We can what, eat a huge variety of foods. If I feed my dog grass, she's not pleased. If I feed my horse a, a, a steak, she's not pleased either. You know, most animals, most mammals have a specialized food type. We can eat all sorts of foods. And that's because we have a dual fuel gut. We have an upper gut, by which I mean the first 20 odd feet of gut, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, small intestine, which is near sterile. And it's near sterile for the business of digesting meat and fat um, uh, and, and a few carbohydrates. And um, uh, that means we produce acid in the upper stomach, which keeps it sterile. We use pancreatic enzymes, bile salts to break down those foods, and then they're absorbed. By contrast, the lower gut, which is about the last three foot of gut, the large bowel, is full of microbes. There are trillions of them. There are more microbes in the large bowel than there are cells in our body. And they are there to deal with, with vegetable fiber and, 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 and other fibers. And it's a fermenting gut. Now, problems arise when the upper gut, the first 20 odd foot, um, becomes overwhelmed by sugars and carbohydrates in modern Western diets. And the upper gut begins to ferment. Bacteria move in there, yeast move in there, and they ferment sugars and carbohydrates in the upper gut. Sugars and carbohydrates are not you know, in, in the large quantities we're consuming at the moment are not evolutionary correct. Yes, we need a few, but not the all the bread and the pasta and the pastry and the and the fruit juice and the um, and the sugars that we're eating in, in modern Western diets. Now if the upper gut starts to ferment, it becomes full of bacteria and yeast. 
Now, we're taught at medical school, yes, the gut is full of bacteria and yeast, there they remain. We now know that's not true. We now know these microbes get into the bloodstream quite easily, and that's called bacterial translocation or fungal uh, translocation. And uh, they circulate in the bloodstream and they get stuck at distal sites. They get stuck in joints and they drive arthritis. They get stuck in the, in the airways and they drive intrinsic asthma. They get stuck in the skin and they drive urticaria. And they get stuck in the muscles where they drive fibromyalgia because the immune system sees these bacteria and yeast in the muscles and think, oh, that's not right. They shouldn't be there and starts to fight them, starts to react against them. And that's probably a very good thing. It stops us dying from septicemia, but it fights these microbes. And in fighting the microbes, there is inflammation. And where there's inflammation, there's pain, redness, heat, swelling, loss of function. So my guess is that the mechanism of fibromyalgia has much to do with that. And it's very common in people with fatigues because of poor energy delivery. And if you've not got good energy delivery, you get leaky gut. The whole thing spirals down into um, um, uh, a, a, a more complex clinical picture, let's say. So my job as a physician is to try to tease out those threads that result in these clinical pictures and put people on the necessary curative regime to actually reverse pathology. When, just to backtrack a bit, when it comes to asking questions, because you emphasise the why, what, what questions are allopathic doctors not asking their patients? I mean, they maybe ask about what they're eating, but what about other aspects like what time do they go to bed? How much time are they spending outside? What do you feel is missing um, in a regular consultation? They're not asking any of those questions. I mean, my patients have never been asked you know, what, what are you eating and, and why? I'm um, just to give an example of this. When I was working at Shrewsbury Hospital um, as, a, a, as a GP, with a special interest in ME, I had a girl who came to see me who was oh, early 20s and she was almost paralysed from the waist downwards. Oh, she said, my neurologist says there's nothing. And she couldn't walk. She was on crutches. So she was swinging her legs through. Oh, she said, my neurologist said there's nothing wrong with me. I've got ME. And I said, you haven't got ME. You have got a neurological disorder. What do you eat? What do you drink? Oh, she said, nobody's ever asked me that. But to cut a long story short, she was consuming three litres a day of Diet Coke. To cut an even longer story short, she had aspartame poisoning. Aspartame, which is the main sweetener used in Diet Coke, is broken down in the liver to formaldehyde, which is a neurotoxin. Within three months of cutting out her Diet Coke and all the sweeteners completely and having some physio to get strong, she was walking normally. Now, if I hadn't asked that question, that girl would have proceeded to probably long-term paralysis and disability, and she'd have been told, oh, you know, you've got ME, and, uh, and that's the top and bottom of it. So that's just a lovely example of, you know, how a very simple question completely unraveled her, her neurological disease. Oh, no, that's very empowering because I think people view um, artificial sweeteners as a sometimes healthy option instead of sugar. And they're just as damaging in different ways. Uh, and, and especially, as you mentioned, as a neurotoxin. So that's profoundly useful for people because um, there are there was a big study that came out last year conclusively saying they also ca uh, cause cardiovascular disease. Yet you, if you go on the Internet, there are people saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. it's only small amounts. But that's a really empowering story. And I think it's just like asking one question so you mentioned um, the mitochondria and the gut microbiome and I think we're outnumbered and we've got one human cell for every 10 microbial cell and they communicate and the mitochondria are one of my favorite subjects and my audience likes them as well because they not only make ATP they also make deuterium depleted water infrared light which is again something you might want to mention pregnenolone which is really important they make melatonin and what I found on your website was that you have a mitochondria test. I saw it, it advertised. Do you want to go into the mitochondria in a bit more detail? Because some people, yes. their knowledge is up here and other people, it, they just know it's something that makes energy uh, and we need to protect it. Correct. Well, well, mitochondria are absolutely central to life. The difference between life and death is energy. If we can't generate energy, then we are dead. You know, if 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 our, um, a mitochondria, little engines within cells, and every cell has many hundreds. You know, um, uh, heart cells have about two thousand mitochondria. The human uh, over um, has a hundred thousand mitochondria. They are there to generate energy for that for that cell. And without energy, the cell does not function. 
And um, for mitochondria to, to work well, they have to have um, the right fuel in the tank. Um, they have to have uh, the raw materials necessary to function. They have to be free from toxic stress. And they have to have the control mechanisms, right, the thyroid and the adrenal glands. So we can't talk about mitochondria in isolation because they are so dependent on all these other factors. And the most desirable fuel for mitochondria are ketone bodies. And ketones come when we eat a diet which is rich in fat and fiber. And so this is always the starting point to treat absolutely everything because mitochondria are involved in almost any pathological process you care to mention. We know they're central to Alzheimer's disease, to heart disease, um, to cancer, um, to chronic fatigue syndromes, to ME, to arthritis, to diabetes, you name it, and mitochondria are centrally important. And to get our mitochondria working well, the first thing we have to do is to fuel them correctly. And the point about ketones is they can be oxidized, they can be burnt, they can be metabolized in mitochondria with minimal damage to the mitochondria. They've, it flows through very easily with minimal free radicals being produced, minimal exhaust gases, as I think of them. But by contrast, if you burn sugar in mitochondria, yes, in the short term, it's rocket fuel, but it goes through with friction. It goes through mitochondria producing a lot of free radicals. So it's very damaging to them and it ages them. And we know that people who eat sugar and high carbohydrate diets are prematurely aged and uh, do not have the quality of life or the quantity of life that uh, we should expect. One, you know, um, so, and this is why people who are diabetic and who are overweight don't live to a great age because those people have been running their lives on sugars and carbohydrates for decades. And it's highly damaging to their mitochondria. And that is the mechanism by which they develop pathology. So when it comes to our mitochondrial engines, the first thing we have to do is fuel them correctly with the paleo ketogenic diet. What about then um, the water that produces, because doesn't fat produce a um, hundred equivalents of water at the end, which is vital for us, and, and the carbs only produce um, the equivalents. And I suppose for the geeks here, the um, electrons go into straight into complex two with the fats, and complex one is the one that's really leaky. That, like as you say, the the broken hole in the exhaust fumes. So just for the um, there's obviously the foxes and the hedgehogs that for the for the geeks. Just to iterate, we're not making up something. Um, it's <laughs> Well, no, I, I don't do geekiness. I'm a very practical doctor and I try and speak the language that, that we all speak. And, and the car analogy, which I always like love to use, everybody can get it. So for our, our car to run, which is our body, we've got to have a mitochondrial engine. We've got to have the right fuel in the tank. Um, we've got to have um, oxygen delivery uh, 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 working well. We've got to have uh, the control mechanisms, the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. And with all those things in place, and attention to those details, then energy flows. And when energy flows, everything falls into place. The immune system can work efficiently. The brain starts to function at a high level. The gut can digest well. We've got the energy we need to go and hunt and, and, and farm and, and work and all that. So attention to those little details and as I say everything else falls into place. Oh, yeah. And you also mentioned mitochondrial toxins. So I did my postdoc on statins and we won't go into that because that's a great big rabbit hole. But for people who are listening, they are a mitochondrial toxin and cholesterol is not the enemy. And that's one of my hated medications. The other one is metformin because I just feel there are so many holistic ways to lower your blood sugar, not just diet, but exercise, sure. changing your light environment, getting out of blue light, going to bed earlier. And then the third one would be SSRIs because again, I think we're gonna talk about depression because that ties in with chronic fatigue. So what would be some of your really hated medications where you feel that you- Well, you're absolutely right. You've also detailed three of my most hated medications. <laughs> One that comes absolutely top of the pops are the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, um, because you know, for our stomach to, to be sterile, for our stomach to digest protein, for our stomach to absorb minerals, for our stomach to protect us against infection, we need acid. And if you block acid production in the stomach with PPIs, you, that is hugely damaging. And I'm quite sure the PPIs are driving our current epidemics of, um, uh, uh, of cancer, of esophageal cancer, of stomach cancer, of bowel cancer, because it's allowing 
by not having an acid stomach, it's allowing the upper gut to become colonized with bacteria and with yeast and probably viruses as well. And, and, and that is very damaging. I wrote a book some years ago, uh, which I've just rewritten called um, The Infection Game. Life is an arms race. And the point here is that you and I are a free lunch. We're a free meal for all those microbes, bacteria, yeast and viruses, which would love to make themselves at home in our delicious, warm, comfortable, well-fed bodies where they can have free sex. Mm -hmm. And of course, all we now know that all pathology, all cancers, all dementias, all heart disease have an infectious driver. Uh, and so if we can keep the infectious load in our body to a minimum, that means the immune system has doesn't have to fight big battles, it can fight little battles, and we can keep these microbes at bay. And we now know that an awful lot of ME is driven by chronic Epstein-Barr virus infection. So we all get Epstein-Barr virus, 90% of the population will test positive to it. But it's those people who don't have good immune function, the virus will prevail and will take over and you'll end up with high levels in your body driving pathology. And we know it's associated with dementia, with breast cancer, with many lymphomas and leukemias. It's a really nasty little virus. So we have to look after our immune system and our immune system is our standing army. And standing armies, they need a lot of raw materials and they need a lot of energy to fight. And standing armies, yes, they're absolutely essential to protect us from, from infection. Um, but if we alert our standing armies um, for the wrong reasons, for reasons of allergy, then that's like the army of the country you know, fighting foreign tourists who are actually coming to the country and making money for us. Or if you turn the um, immune system in on itself, that's called civil war. And that's autoimmunity. And autoimmunity is very bad news. And the most pro-inflammatory thing you can do to your body, the, the thing you can do that is most likely to switch on inflammation is eat sugars and carbohydrates. And sugars are markedly pro-inflammatory and, again, drive an awful lot of pathology because they switch on the immune system. And because it's sugar, the immune system then doesn't get the energy to fight efficiently. So they really are very bad, dangerous foods indeed. Small amounts are fine. The large amounts consumed in Western diets are bad news for the body. So um, what else do you think um, is causing all of this epidemic in um, weak immune systems? Would you say it's our environment as well, like too much blue light? Because obviously that raises blood sugar as well. And you mentioned that that's a problem. Too much technology being inside too much. Um, Correct. All, all that's the drain. But in order of priority, um, number one is sugars and carbohydrates. And number two is micronutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, a very, very helpful nutrient for diabetes and high blood sugar is uh, benfetiamine, which is which is the fat soluble form of thiamine. It's not expensive. And, and just that alone will reverse diabetes, about one gram a day. And if people are struggling with a keto diet, again, it's a very useful addition to their diet. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's necessary for um, mitochondria to be able to burn sugar to access mitochondria. How does that differ from TTFD? Because that's another um, thiamine uh, that's, uh, that's also um, very popular because it can get into the brain. And I think people mistake vitamin B1 uh, when there's actually better forms. So I think what you just said is really profound. It's similar. It, it does the same thing. I mean, we could, as I, as I say, there's, there's there's several ways to skin a cat, aren't there? So, um, but basically, we want a fat soluble form of thiamine because they're in access, get through cell membranes easily, access the brain, and do the job much better. Um, when it comes into mental health i think that's massively neglected that people are depressed or anxious and i sometimes don't feel like asking somebody about their way of eating because they feel like i'm going to attack them but mm. i never would but there are so many studies now coming out about the benefits of um, ketones for bipolar and stuff Correct. what would your take be and how would you approach this very very sensitive topic because it's very a personal and people get very defensive and upset yet it's like you say it's, it's glaringly obvious i meet somebody and you just know i wish if you just moved into just paleo you'd feel better well I, i'm afraid as i get older uh, and more irritable and i want to get uh, 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 and less lovely and less nice perhaps i want to get to the nub of the matters and i'm afraid i trample through people's sensitivities you might think that's very rude but um, my job is to tell people how to get better, and then it's up to them how they tackle that. And the key point about sugars and carbohydrates is that they are highly addictive.
And we use addictions to deal with stress. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows, you know, when they have a, they had a really stressful day, they want to have a couple of glasses of wine to calm them down. People smoke because uh, nicotine has a calming effect in the short term. People use um, cannabis for the same reason. It has a calming effect. And by contrast, if they want to be fired up, they go for caffeine or they go for um, 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 cannabis, uh, not cannabis, um, uh, cocaine or amphetamine, you know, all these nasty drugs. And we all know that all addictions are damaging. But the most pernicious addiction worldwide and the one that is least well recognized are sugars and carbohydrates. And we eat sugars and carbohydrates in an addictive way to control stress. So that's the first lesson, if you like, that people have to understand why they're going for those carbohydrates. They're not eating them because their body needs them. They're eating them for reasons of addiction. And what and the joy of a ketogenic diet is you get off those addictive um, substances. So all addictions we know give us uppers and downers uh, and you get an upper from having your addiction and then you get a downer and that drives you to taking another dose. And it's the same with sugars. We get uppers and downers from sugars. And that means people snack on carbohydrates and sugars throughout the day, whether it's sweet drinks, fruit juice, biscuits, crisps, chocolate, whatever. You know, it, it's not rocket science, is it? No. So, and they're using those to say to deal with stress. So the sugar gives you a temporary boost of energy because, as I mentioned earlier, in the short term it is rocket fuel, but then you get a, 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 and with that comes an upper, but then you get the down after that. So by fueling the body with fat and with fiber, uh, not only is that a desirable fuel for ketones, but you iron out those uppers and downers. And that's the first step to treating any um, uh, disease with any mental disease, whether it's depression, anxiety, or psychosis. But there's even more interesting uh, aspect than this, than that. And this was described by a Japanese researcher called Nishihara. And what he showed is that if you have fermenting microbes in the upper gut, those microbes can get into the brain via the vagus nerve, now, the vagus nerve, the biggest nerve that comes out of the brain, of course, is the spinal cord. The vagus nerve is the second largest uh, nerve that comes out of the brain. And those microbes get into the brain where they can ferment neurotransmitters in the brain. And they ferment them into LSD-like substances, into amphetamine-like substances. And this is the basis of psychosis. We all know, you, know, you ask any doctor who works in casualty, if a young person comes in with psychosis, it's nearly always drug-induced. It's cannabis, typically. But if you're fermenting those, if you're making those neurotransmitters in your brain, then you know that is the basis of manic depression and schizophrenia. And how do we treat that? We treat it with a ketogenic diet. We starve out those microbes in the upper gut so you don't feed them sugars and carbohydrates so that they can prevail. And therefore, you starve out the microbes in the brain. And we have psychiatrists who have treated psychosis very successfully in the past simply with ketogenic diets and then with it with other interventions to help the mitochondria. So Carl Pfeiffer, Abram Hoffer are the, are the classic two, but there are psychiatrists today who treat these patients with ketogenic diets with fabulous results. And the point here is you're not just managing the condition with symptom suppressing drugs. And we know that major tranquilizers, okay, they damp down the symptoms, but they turn people into zombies with no personality, no drive and no interest. We are actually curing the condition. We're reversing it. We're, re we're, we're returning these to normal people. Now, I don't pretend it's an easy path, but it's the biologically plausible path. It's the physiologically correct path. And we actually effect a cure. And that's what we should be looking for. And as I say to all my patients, there's only one person that can get you well, and that's you. You know, I can talk the talk, but you've got to walk the walk. And of course, I walk the walk too. any physician who is advocating these um, uh, interventions has to walk the walk themselves. And I'm delighted to hear, Sarah, that you are in ketosis um, and doing ketogenic diet because if you I, do, I do everything I, I tell people to do and just to backtrack about being nasty, I've got much more impatient and angry at people for not <laughs> um, providing me feedback about what they're eating and when, what their daily life is. And, and I used to think, oh, they're depressed, whatever, be kind. And I'm thinking I'm actually being cruel by not slamming down with a hammer 
because I, I, I it has to be said, and the, and you just hammered it home then that only you can cure you. And also, I've got to set an example, and I've got to prove to myself that ketogenic diets work, changing my circadian rhythm works, doing Pilates or basic exercise, meditation, because then I do, and I believe in my own treatments. Whereas, how many doctors have ever taken olanzapine or um or or sertraline or they wouldn't touch their own drugs? So correct. Um, totally with you about your routine and I know it wasn't on my list of questions but I want to know now what your daily routine is as well okay well um uh, uh I get up uh, first thing I, I I'm, I'm an early bird I, I rise early and um I have an underactive thyroid uh, and adrenal gland which is b- both very common as we age so I take a thyroid a glandular and adrenal gland on rising and then I get out in my garden and I feed my pigs and my um, uh, ducks and my chickens and uh, do basic gardening and so on. And then I come in and then there's an old boy I look after um, uh, called Tony, who I give him breakfast. And he has he's a ketogenic diet. In July, we will celebrate his 101st birthday. He is as sharp as a tack. He has no cancer, no heart disease, no dementia. He really is extremely well. Now, I don't eat breakfast. I like to eat all my food within a six, seven hour window of time. And the reason for that is um, uh, has to, is because intermittent fasting is actually very good for us. And um, uh, and it, after 16 hours of, of ketogenic diet and, and then followed by intermittent fasting, after 16 hours, you switch on autophagy or self-eating. And we know that is highly protective against cancer, dementia and heart disease. So I have my lunch at about 12 o'clock. And that is comprised of keto bread that I make myself, which is linseed bread. Um, and then I've got my own ducks. And uh, so I have uh, two duck eggs and um, maybe some sausages from my pigs. And I don't eat at all in the afternoon, of course. And then about half past five, six o'clock, I have my evening meal, which is a good one. And I, I'm very lucky. I'm a keen gardener. So the starter is usually salad from the garden, which I'm eating at the moment. Main course will be um, some of my pig meat, which will be, um, you know, pork chop or sausages or burger or whatever with um and i've got some few new potatoes in the garden at the moment so i'm digging new potatoes uh and then lots of green vegetables and then pudding will be berries with coconut milk so um and i pretty much eat that most days and it's absolutely delicious and i love it and it's nearly all um home produced so um it's organic and uh, i eat within a window of time and that's what i and, and I expect I will um, do even more uh, with I that. Expect you know, you'll live, I expect you'll live till you're over 100 as well. Well, I don't know about that because what determines our longevity are mitochondria. And mitochondria come down the female line. And my mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, none of them made 60. So I'm probably on borrowed time already. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I um, even though my degree was in genetics, I um, don't think it's um, it loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So I'm putting my bets on you living till till you're a hundred. And actually, speaking of intermittent fasting, I do it the opposite way to you. I get up, go for a walk, come back, eat breakfast, go to the gym, and then I I close my eating window at two o'clock, and then I have to do um, all the way in the evening and overnight. Uh, but people find find that really difficult because I think I used to do it the other way around but it made my cortisol go crazy and mm. it's like you say each to your own as long as your eating window isn't 16 hours because some people are eat 10 meals a day from mm. dawn till dusk and I think mm. you also touch on a really important point of don't eat close to bed because I would say it just disrupts leptin you're and also it's yeah. going to annoy the gut because it wants to go to sleep and I think you brought up lots of really important points and something else I know there are meat snobs out there that say pork meat is lower quality than beef because of the puffers but you know if you've got your own pig yourself I'd much rather it um, know where it's coming from then even if it says it's grass fed uh, it might not be so maybe if you want to kind of elaborate on your routine and how it might vary from person to person who couldn't live on a farm and have, a, have their own pigs and ducks well well um um you know so humans have got the remarkable gut and we can cope with a wide variety of foods and i think the point is is you just have to do your best um to eat as cleanly as you possibly can so you know my daughter 
lives in Brighton, but she gets an organic food box and that arrives once a week. And it's it's whatever um, uh, the guy has available. Uh, and then, of course, she, I, I supply with as much meat as, as possible when I go down and visit her. So everybody has to just work out their own regimes that, that, that suit themselves. But the bottom line is it wants to be as fresh as possible or, or frozen. I don't mind frozen. I think that's fine. As organic as possible. Um, um, as uh, 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 and grown locally as possible, and we never arrive. We're never going to be perfect, but we we just constantly try to nudge things along a bit and improve things a bit and improve things a bit and improve things a bit until we finally um, hit the gong. Yeah, I think that's really important because a lot of people get so overwhelmed from too much yes. watching the internet, and they think, "Well, I can't afford this. Where could I buy raw dairy? I don't have any Correct. grass fed." Whereas if they just, and this is going to lead into my next question, if they just get rid of the major energy draining culprits. So I was going to ask you, um, what do you think uh, are the major a energy draining culprits in our society? Absolutely everything, not just food and supplements. Obviously, you can include bad supplements. Um, drugs um, or whatever you think is kind of really sucking our energy dry, something that you, know, you mentioned artificial sweeteners as well earlier, which uh, I'm sometimes guilty of using and I think other people will be. But maybe if you give a lowdown of how not to drain your batteries. Well, it's it's all the stuff we've been talking about. So, you know, um, uh, uh, sugars and carbohydrates, obviously, um, taking um, uh, supplements, I think, is, is really important. Sleep, I think we must be as disciplined about sleep as we are about food. And most people do not get enough sleep. And um, the average requirement is probably about eight hours and you get the best hours of sleep before midnight. So early to bed, early to rise uh, is my philosophy. And uh, we sleep when it's dark. So you need less sleep in the summer and more sleep in the winter. Try to arrange things so that um, uh, uh, you, know, you can get more sleep in the winter because we need more sleep. And the draw about going to bed early is that if you are tired, then you will sleep on a bit in the morning and and catch up that way but if you go to bed late um then there's just not time in the morning to do that so um uh, you know and say so you get your best quality sleep before midnight so sleep is absolutely vital so dark room quiet you don't want somebody snoring next door to you uh, and so on and so forth so sleep is vital sunshine is really important and um it's so good for our mood for our energy um it's it uh produces uh, structured water in the body, which is um, which is very important for circulation and reducing, as I call, the friction in the biochemical system. Um, again, organic food. I don't know if you have read Stephanie Senna's book. Oh, yes, she was on my podcast. Really? She hasn't, um, I haven't uploaded it yet, and she's a genius with the oh, space. I love absolutely. Stephanie Senna. And, 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 you know, I mean, yes, I do... I do see organic food is, an expen is expensive, but when you see the multiple ways in which glyphosate is so damaging to our bodies in terms of energy delivery mechanism, connective tissue, carcinogenic, you know, cancer driving, um, uh, uh, disrupting our microbiome, 58, I think it's 52% of the microbes in our gut are sensitive to glyphosate and have the potential to be killed. Now, we don't know much about the microbiome, but what we do know is that the more diverse it is, the healthier we are. Now, if you knock off half of your microbiome with glyphosate, that's very bad news for the whole of our metabolism, the whole of our physiology. So um, uh, as far as possible, you know, try to eat organic. I think that's terribly important. And also with glyphosate, it knocks out the shikimate pathway for making tryptophan. And because we've been talking about anxiety and depression and you need tryptophan to make your own serotonin and melatonin for sleep. So I think that's another big kicker as well um, for, for glyphosate. And I think even um, sort of um, washing the food, because people think just because it's organic, they, they just can eat it straight away. But um, washing, it's obviously really important. And speaking of washing, you mentioned structured water. And again, that's something I'm really into. And it's sort of very, some people know all about it and other people, it's all brand new to them. It's about how it's this special water that um, lubricates the surfaces inside our bodies and especially the lining of our blood uh, vessels. And it's like um, the more structured water you've got, the better the prognosis is because there's even studies on cancer and structured water. And you mentioned sunshine and I meant, was going to mention infrared in a minute because you, I know you have a sword. Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to explain what structured water is, and this is developed, uh, described by a wonderful physicist called uh, Gerald Pollock, who, who first described it. 
And the point is, water can exist in three forms that we know about, obviously liquid water, obviously ice and steam. But he describes a fourth phase of water, which he calls exclusion zone or structured water. And this is what water molecules do when they align themselves against the surface. Now, that surface might be glass, but of course, in the body, it's cell membranes. And we have acres and acres and square kilometers of cell membranes in our body. And against um, um, a, a membrane, it aligns itself in a honeycomb structure, uh, a little bit like graphite for the chemists. And if you tot up the electrons and the protons in there, you find you've got too many protons. So the reason it's called exclusion zone water is it um, excludes protons from its honeycomb structure. And what that means is that all membranes are negatively charged. And the energy for that negative charge comes from infrared, it comes from sunshine, and it comes from heat. It comes from the heat that we generate in muscles. <clears throat> now, if, if, if all, let's just look at the circulation of blood. I've always wondered how it is that, that blood circulates through capillaries. Because, yes, of course, we have a heart that pumps blood and it sends it to the pre-capillary arterioles under pressure. But the pressure gradient between the afferent and the efferent side of our capillaries, where the blood comes in and where the blood goes out, well, there is none. The pressure is the same. So how does blood flow through capillaries? And the answer is it's electrical pressure that's generated by exclusion phase or four phase water. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, and the other point to remember, of course, if all membranes are negatively charged, this means that red cells and white cells won't stick to the lining of capillaries. They will flow through them in a frictionless way, just like two magnets oppose each other. So with good exclusion zone water, you massively improve your circulation of blood at the capillary level and you massively reduce the biochemical friction in all systems, including mitochondria. So. This is why exclusion zone is so important. And what can we do to improve that? Well, um, first of all, sulfur is very helpful for improving exclusion zone water, as is magnesium. And one of my favorite multitasking tools is Epsom salt bath. We can all afford those. Um, uh, half a kilogram of Epsom salts cost about 50 pence. A good soak in that will give us a lovely dose of magnesium and sulfate. And a nice warm bath will uh, gives us the heat as far in bread. That warms us up. So Epsom salt baths are fabulous for almost any condition you like to mention. And in addition to that, they help us to detox. Sunshine, ditto. Sunshine is free energy, free exclusion zone water, less friction in the system, better circulation. That's got to be good for all um, uh, pathology. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, very, very important exclusion zone water. I think also for people who didn't understand what you were just saying about the capillaries is the blood cells, if they're flexible, they can actually change shape and push themselves down the capillary. And it ties back into what you were saying about chronic fatigue, chronic pain, that there's also a link between poor capillary function as well and pain, isn't there? I just wanted to check with you. So Correct. it's something people who've got fibromyalgia and they've got the poor mitochondrial function, so they're not making the deuterium depleted water, they're not going outside and not structuring it they're not eating enough ketones because obviously we said earlier that's going to produce more water as well and then it's all making the picture really clear because i think the other question i was going to ask you that's really important is people who've got depression or anxiety or chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or me how can you reassure them that you can um, get better i mean if, if they're listening now they will have heard all of this advice but just from your own very large clinical experience you must have seen thousands of people get better if not more yeah, well, you just have to say, trust me, take a leap of faith and just do it. Mm. And, you know, it's, you know, people want to be told they're going to get well. Well, look, I can't do that. Nobody can do that. You know, uh, and they know that we're taking telling porky pies, but they just have to trust your clinical experience and think, well, is this a good person? Is this a bad person? You know, is it biologically plausible? Is there science to follow, follow to uh, back all this up? And the answer is a, a, a resounding yes. And, you know, and we all see people taking drugs and, you know, are they getting better? Are they recovering? Are they reversing their pathology? And the answer is a resounding no. It's just maintaining things. It's just controlling the symptoms until they eventually succumb. So, you know, I, th I think that much of this derives from addiction. People are so addicted to their carbohydrate based diets. They can't possibly countenance the thought of giving them up. 
and uh, and therefore they want lots of reassurance and patting on the back. And well, I'm afraid I'm old and irritable. I'm not prepared to do that anymore. I'm prepared to show people the path, but they have to walk it themselves. But also, you're fighting against the um, diet and food industries, the big fu- uh, the big food thing, because they pay dietitians to tell people, oh, it's okay to have a Kit Kat if it's in your calorie range. Then there's lots of bros on the internet, you know, like 25 year old men trying to tell people, oh yeah, it's okay. Don't listen to these stupid keto people. As long as it's within your calorie window, you're allowed Kit Kats. But again, it's just like saying to me, oh, Sarah, you can smoke if you want, but just only have three a day. Correct. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Doesn't work. Yeah. What do the alcoholics celebrate? They celebrate complete abstinence. Mm. You know, you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know, the only thing they will tolerate is complete abstinence because they know if they have one drink, you know, it, that switches on the craving, and they're not happy until they're completely blotto. And it's the same with. Uh, I know I'm an addict. I come from a family of addicts, and you know, I know with sugar, it's got to be complete abstinence because if I have a little bit. I want the whole thing. You know, I couldn't. I couldn't have a square of chocolate. The whole bar would disappear. So, um, so that's how I do it, and that's how everybody probably has to do it. Like you, I completely understand how people are feeling. Well, I do within reason, and I know it's difficult, and I know it's hard. That's why um, it's really helped me today for you to say just punch them in the face with it. You're you're going to save their lives. And also something really profound that you said was people taking all this medication is speeding up the underlying process. And that I think that is just like such a take home message that that even that phrase alone, anybody can understand if you keep taking this medicine, it, you're in it, your insides are going to rot quicker, basically, if you know, it's just the word warning. That doesn't mean go yeah. away and stop your medication. Oh, no, I know. What you yes. have to do is put in place the necessary regimes, the ketogenic diet, the supplements, the, the sleep discipline, the exercise or whatever, and then tell the medications off and monitor. So if you've got high blood pressure, get yourself a blood pressure cuff and, and monitor it home. To, so, so it's coming down. So, um, uh, uh, that's the way to go about it. But also, I think, as, as you said, that when you start on one medication, it can lead to two for the side effects, then three and then four. And I think it's just I know people who think, oh, um, it's all right. There'll be another medicine for me. And I think, you know, you always get a massive gem from a person. And I think that one is really one fr- from you that for especially people who are on lots of medication. So on a different subject, when it comes to spirituality and stuff like that, you obviously live out in nature. Um, and there are studies showing that religious practices, spiritual practices, uh, outperform antidepressants and it doesn't matter if people believe in anything or not so what's your take on the more esoteric side of life and how people can deal with chronic disease because some people have got terminal cancer some people have got very serious bipolar or, 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 or whatever how can you bring something else into their life to help them that's not biochemistry well, I don't pretend to be expert in that, no. um, uh, and and I would um, uh, and everybody has to find their own path. There's a wonderful book by Kelly Turner called Radical Remission, mm. and what she did is she went um, uh, uh, and interviewed people who had had all the cancers, the surgery, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, and were told you've got a few months to live, but they turned their lives around and they, they, they survived. And she asked the question, what did you do that made the difference? How did you reverse your cancer? What, how did you solve? Now you would think doctors would be fascinated by this question, wouldn't you? You'd think they'd be saying, what are you doing that's different? How did you cure yourself? And uh, the answer is they radically changed their diet. They radically changed their lifestyle. They took control of their disease. They said, blow this from monkeys. You know, I'm not going to do what you tell me. I know Jolly will get better on my own. And they, they had a horizon. They had a project they wanted to do. They had a, a garden they wanted to dig or they had a family they had to look after. You know, they had a, they had a meaning to their life and, and then other techniques. But she details seven um, uh, top interventions or maybe it was nine. I think it's nine interventions uh, that she that she uh, recommends. And uh, and that's what you do. You take control of your life. You don't let your disease control you. You say, blow this from my kids. I'm blooming. I'm going to go and do it. But the starting point is the diet. They all changed their diet and many of them did intermittent fasting. That is absolutely crucial. Oh, definitely, because um, not going without food just teaches you to go up without other things. But I think what you said about the garden, it's something like just getting a dog that you have to look after somebody else and not obsess yeah. with yourself or get an allotment or even just grow some herbs at home because you've got to get up every day and look after another live being. 
But yes, I, I, I agree. And just to finish off, what would you say from all of your experience with your patients is the biggest barriers to changing their ways of eating? Because it can be problematic and maybe some of the excuses people come up with or things that you found really helpful for somebody that's listening and just can't seem to stop eating carbs. It's their own brain they've got to sort out. It's okay. addiction. And, and and often family, you know, uh, and, and the family are all addicts too and, and, and discourage them. But also the doctors. Very often people, they listen to me and then they go and run the ideas past their doctor or their GP who pats on and says, oh, no, no, that's got nothing to do with it. You know, don't bother your silly mind with that. You know, we've got the proper medicine. So doctors are often obstructive. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's so important to, to work it out for yourself Take control of what you're going to do and just jolly well do it. And in the short term, you will get worse. And that's the truth for any addiction. It's it's difficult. It's a hard path to walk. You will get withdrawal symptoms. But in the long term, you will be a different person. You might know a friend of mine, Dr. Ian Lake. He's very yes. much all about um, how many of your Correct. doctors um, are open to a ketogenic diet and how many are not. And he's just sent me an email with all of the, the data. And, and I think it's really something that infuriates me. I've had my um, clients and patients being told to stop do a ketogenic diet. And one of them was diabetic and on two medications and five stone overweight and her blood sugar was going down. And she was um, and the doctor just said, oh, no, this is just a fad to stop doing it it's dangerous and and this lady now you know what am I you have to just walk away but I think what you've just said about obstructive doctors and then um Ian Lake because anyone who's listening he's a type 1 diabetic that's very um he's very knowledgeable about ketogenic diet and low carb he's also a really nice man as well so he's worth a, a look and a listen so well, yes. if you're, if you're, if you're patient like that, start on benfotiamine, one gram daily, uh, and that will that will help a lot. Um, uh, and maybe then she'll rethink keto, but she just must do it. Otherwise, she's heading. It's like a, a tanker heading for the rocks. She's going to hit the rocks and, and sink. So would you say benfotiamine is superior to, say, uh, apple cider vinegar or berberine or um, or chromium or vanadium? <laughs> They all work in different mechanisms. And for some people, it's the chromium that does it. And for some, it's the apple cider vinegar that does it. But benfotiamine's got a very good track record. Okay, that's another useful thing. Because I think sometimes people need a bit of hand-holding. I know that I'm a very much pull the plaster off all in one go, but other people need to introduce MCT oils just to get used to a new fuel. And I think if people see their blood sugar go down, because obviously you can, it's very cheap, it's 20 pounds to buy a blood sugar measure. It, it inspires right. them. They think, oh good, something's working. Let me just carry on. So that'll definitely be a, a take-home message. Uh, and I suppose just to finish off, um, Post-pandemic, um, have you seen a great rise? I know we touched on it at the beginning of things like chronic fatigue, depression, and for people who um, their doctors have told them it's all in their head about the spike protein, what what um, sort of, not medical advice, what sort of um, s- sort of reassurance could you give these people and what could they do? Well, you know, as I say, my job is not to reassure. My uh, my job is, is to show them the path. And, and okay. but yes, lockdown was very bad news for us. And um, uh, COVID was has turned out to be a mild infection. And the real damage is now coming from COVID. And death rates are now running at about 2,000 people dying per week over and above what we would expect. So it's, it's the causing the, the uh, pathology now, not COVID. That's that's like really terrifying. And I think we'll just leave it there to let let it sink in. But I think, again, it's like anything. Our bodies are very well geared for dealing with toxins, microbes, mRNA, uh, graphene and stuff like that. So it is possible to overcome this and get it out. But the people are going to have to change their lifestyle in order to facilitate recovery from the the jab or the infection. Correct. And. um, just so people know where to find you, because obviously you're a wealth of knowledge and um, you offer all sorts of different um, options from taking on clients. You do courses, you do retreats. Do you want to tell people a bit about how they can find you? And- just go to my website, which if you just Google Dr. Myhill, my website comes up and there are details of the books that I run, the online courses that I do that anybody can join. And, and we have a lot of fun with those. Uh, or um, sometimes I run courses uh, um, and people come to my home um, and we have to max out at 12 people and I talk medicine for three days. And we have a lot of fun doing that. We eat a keto diet. We sit around my eco pool and we use the sauna and the hot tub 
Um, and um, the next session is in June, which is strawberry season. So we will eat very well in June. <laughs> oh, right. OK, so there's options for clinicians, patients, anybody, uh, curious people. And obviously they've seen you and met you now. And even though you pretend to be grumpy and, and stuff, you're, you're not. <laughs> If they don't change their diet, they might get a um, a grumpy version of you. But other than that, it's really fun and, uh, and really informative. Because I'm only scratching the surface of your knowledge today, and I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing all this with everybody. My my pleasure. My absolute pleasure.